as our company, which, as we know, is perfect for, for a panel. Probably everyone else is busy watching another episode of some TV series that we are missing right now. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Lipovetsky. I'm professor uh, of Russian uh, studies at the Department of Slavic Languages of Columbia University. And today is uh, the next session of the Columbia Russian Film, Film Club which uh, we are running together with uh, Daria Yezirova, who is uh, the postdoctoral fellow at the Harriman Institute and the film scholar. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you have been following us, but just in case, uh, we decided this semester because of the COVID complications not to do the film screenings as we would typically do, but uh, to run the series of debates, uh, of discussions with experts about uh, subjects pertaining to, to Russian film and today even TV, we have expanded our horizons. Uh, we already had uh, the debate about uh, Ilya Krozhanovsky's project uh, DAO, um, then we had another debate about uh, uh, Kantimir Balagov's film uh, Dilda or Binpol. And today we are uh, hoping to have an exciting debate about new Russian TV series. Uh, and uh, Dasha will, will, will set the floor for this most interesting discussion. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I just to kind of add uh, one detail about um, the the webinar series that we're doing this semester. Uh, we really are for uh, for the first time focusing on effectively one or a year and a half, the last year and a half of Russian cinema. So we're talking about kind of the the latest trends, and uh, you know that 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 personally for me that makes it uh, even more exciting. Um, and I'm really glad that we're joined today with the such fantastic speakers that I'll introduce in just a little bit. And I am especially excited about this event because it really enabled us to binge watch, this time guilt-free, some of our favorite TV shows for, um, this, uh, for the event uh, tonight. And uh, the, the topic, as uh, Mark already mentioned, is... Um, is a little bit outside of our usual programming. We really mostly focus on, um, on film. And uh, today we decided to talk about uh, series, miniseries, TV um, in, 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 that, uh, in that medium. And we, we have very good reasons to bring um, that part of new Russian media into discussion today. And um, uh, we really, are talking about something very major happening in Russian television in the past, I would say five years, but most certainly in the past two to three years, uh, there has been a fundamental shift in, uh, in, in, in the production of uh, TV series in Russia. And it really goes, uh, it really engages both the form and the content platforms, et cetera. So, uh, one of the one of the kind of characteristic um, elements of of this sh of this shift, um, first and foremost, uh, was the much higher production value behind a lot of uh, popular Russian TV series, and that goes back to probably year 2015 with the TV series like uh, Ismiene, Infidelity, for instance. And then the, the production value really just uh, kept, um, kept growing. Uh, and here we can talk about a series like Method, Storm, Cheeky, Gold Diggers, etc. cetera. Uh, and of course, for the, for the higher production value and the coattails of that, is the uh, phenomenon of Russian TV series being purchased by uh, major international streaming platforms like Amazon Prime and Netflix. Uh, the second element um, of this change that I think Russian TV shares with, uh, with its uh, American um, and really international counterparts is that um, probably 
more common than ever these days is that uh, a lot of these series are show run by very established filmmakers and have a cast to match. So just to sort of to give a few names, perhaps, um, uh, you know, that, that we, we can probably trace it all the way to Otipil that was made by Todorovsky famously, and then Optimista that was show run by Papagrebsky. And now um, these names are also joined by Mirkulova and Chupov with series like um, Cold Center, with Natalia Mishininova for Storm, uh, Daria Zhuk and Konstantin Gamolov for Gold Diggers. So it, it really is a kind of a broad phenomenon in, in when it comes to contemporary Russian TV. And uh, the, the final and perhaps most interesting change in, um, in, in this medium is the change in platform. And uh, that one is, 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 is I, I would say, is probably the most important one uh, in that that uh, more TV than ever, more series than ever, are now uh, now premiere on online platforms and just completely circumvent uh, mainstream TV channels, which uh, you know it's it's in, it's interesting in and of itself since we're talking about the about the medium here, but that also uh, really allowed um, several of contemporary Russian uh, TV series to explore uh, previously underrepresented subjects, some of which we'll, we're hoping to touch upon today. Uh, because the the constraints of censorship for streaming platforms are nowhere near um, the same, nowhere near the, the same ones that really apply to to mainstream TV, and uh, which, which makes this sh with this shift ever uh, more interesting. And um, I'm going to stop here. And uh, uh, Mark, why don't you start introducing? Let, let, let's introduce our participants. Right. So we have we have. Um, great group of uh, specialists today, uh, all our friends and not only friends. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll alternate who is introducing whom. So uh, the first uh, participant is Ilyana Prokhorova, an associate, uh, and you can see her under the name Alexander Prokhorov. So that's that's the gender gender tragedy here. Um, uh, Irina Prokhorova is associate uh, professor of Russian studies at the University of William and Mary, where she also teaches in the film media studies program. Her research focuses on identity discourses in late Soviet and post-Soviet television and cinema. She is co-editor of, uh, and if I mispronounce, don't kill me, Cinema Zoros, uh, Russian film in contemporary context with Nancy Conde and Alexander Prokhorov, and her co-author, uh, uh, and co-author with Alexander Prokhorov of the monograph uh, film and television genres of the late Soviet era published in 2017. Her publications have also appeared in Slavic Review, Slavic East European Journal, Kinokultura, Russian Journal of Communication, and in edited volumes. Um, joining from the same screen is uh, Alexander Prokhorov, uh, who is a professor of Russian film studies at William & Mary. He is a co-editor of Cinemasaurus Russian Film uh, in Contemporary Context with Nancy Kondi and Milena Prokhorova. Uh, co-author with Elena Prokhorova of film and television genres uh, of the late Soviet era and the editor of Springtime for Soviet Cinema, reviewing the 1960s. His articles and reviews have been published in Journal of Film and Video, Kinokultura, Russian Review, Slavic Review, Slavic and Eastern European Journal, Studies in Russian Soviet Cinema, Art of Cinema, Iskustve Kino, and, and others. Yes, uh, I'm very happy to introduce Tatiana Mikhailova, a lecturer in Russian at the Slavic uh, Department of Slavic Languages of Columbia University. Uh, she is the author of a number of publications on diverse subjects, including film, gender, glamour, and caricature. She participated in such important uh, volumes, projects as Embracing Arms, Cultural Representation of Slavic and Balkan Women in War, Celebrity and Glamour uh, in Contemporary Russia, Putin as Celebrity and Cultural Icon. Uh, she published her articles in various uh, journals, such as Kinokultura, Soviet and Russian Cinema Studies, Nipriksnavenne Zapas, Znamia, and uh, many others. 
Uh, and last but not least, we have Tanya Efremova, who is a PhD candidate in comparative literature at NYU. Tanya's dissertation focuses on nostalgia and the body in post-Soviet Russian film, television, fashion, and visual culture. Her uh, dissertation chapter dedicated to television explores the gendered body in the aesthetics and spectatorship of melodrama under Putin. And Tanya's work has appeared in academic journals like Digital Icons, Kinokultura, and Senses of Cinema. And she has also written on contemporary Russian culture for the online Moscow media, The Village. All right, so, so uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll jump into the discussion. And um, uh, Dasha has uh, nicely laid the ground. And of course, we all understand that uh, this um, wave of new Russian TV series is a part of the global process, right? And it has been a while since we stopped watching, uh, at least me, I'm talking about myself, stopped watching uh, cinema and started watching uh, TV instead, right? And uh, we all are uh, avid uh, watchers of TV series and we can, uh, when we meet now uh, around the table, if we meet around the table, uh, at a certain point after the certain number of drinks, we start exchanging titles of the newest TV series that we all watch. It became the pastime um, equal to some kind of ritual, right? Um, and uh, a lot has been said about this shift in the global cinema. For example, um, our colleague uh, and friend Alexander Genius has written that in today's world, uh, the TV series replaces the novel. The TV series replaces the novel because uh, I would continue his idea with, with, with my editions because uh, like in the novel, the plot is driven not by the situation now as it used to be before, unlike it was uh, before, but by the, the character development, by the interest, interesting character that develops and produces a new, new, new situations which sort of... Um, create new perspective on the on the reality. And of course, uh, the fact that we are not necessarily watching um, TV series from TV screen all the time, we are watching them from various devices. This also creates uh, a new kind of contact, right? But keeping in mind this global contact, global context, I'm sorry. How would you answer very briefly no more than, than two, three minutes. Uh, the, 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 the most important question that is the title of our debate today, what is new in Russian TV series? What is new in Russian TV series? And, and maybe you would answer in the order we, we introduced if, if, if you don't mind. You don't? Okay, Lena, then you begin. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Dasha and Mark, for this wonderful introduction and for organizing this really important event, I think, because we are really in a new wave of visual culture. And I just want to point out that uh, it's such a relief uh, when after many, many years, a couple of decades of writing about Russian television and cinema, too, that uh, you know, it cannot do this and it cannot do th that and it is in crisis, I can finally say not only do I watch it, but I binge on it, like <laughs> you pointed out. So for me, I think uh, very briefly, what is the most interesting thing and new thing in, in this series is uh, many of them have a recognizable and contemporary setting. It is set in contemporary Russia, many of these series. Uh, sometimes it is the present, sometimes uh, there are some flashbacks to Soviet past, sometimes there is a flash forward to the near future. But it is, I think, really important to even recognize places and they are not um, very often uh, prettified. Um, so contemporary setting, and because of, of these contemporary um, plots, right, and um, narratives, I think, and it, it will sound almost like naive, but I think actors, and many of them employ major uh, film and theater actors, they know what they're playing, which makes all the difference in the world. It becomes less formulaic, 
it becomes um, psychologically uh, very much identifiable, right? Um, and uh, the last but not least, um, contemporary language. Um, as Dasha, I think, pointed out, um, breaking of taboos uh, kind of happens on, on these uh, video on demand platforms, for example, more easily, right? And so you do not have to follow the, um, the recent Russian law, right? On, on using- On obscenities, you mean, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, they, basically you can hear the real voice of, of Russian culture, right? Um, in how, however, formulaic situation is, but but you can still recognize and recognize the the spirit of culture, right? So for me, this uh, this is what attracts me to to this series primarily, right? When I see the culture that I know, you know, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Liana. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um... So what is new? Uh, let me start with uh, new professions. Uh, a profession of a showrunner, which uh, emerged uh, now a full way on um, Russian television production. And um, to give you some examples, uh, Simon Slipakov, uh, if we, for example, look at uh, some of his recent productions, he gives the general idea, and then for each episode, we have uh, very often like a new director who creates for this uh, for this particular idea. Valery Todorovsky would be another example of a showrunner. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a person who combines uh, kind of production of main idea with. Uh, coordinating um, uh, the uh, kind of uh, narrative creation, but uh, there are other directors who work for such a uh, uh, super producer. Uh, and uh, uh, this is very new. Uh, film festivals, right? We know about film festivals uh, for many, many years, but now we have uh, television festivals and uh, we have uh, uh, television festival, television series festival titled Pilot, and we even have a uh, YouTube television production festival, which is a separate festival. It's called Realist Web Fest. Mm. So those festivals are uh, the uh, kind of uh, spaces where uh, new ideas, new formats are uh, tested, discussed by the leaders in the industry, and then, um, well, compete, uh, pitched, um, notably, uh, uh, let's take Kinatabur, one of the, uh, well, the major Russian uh, film festival. It, it has uh, a television series component now. Mm -hmm. and ideas for new uh, TV series are pitched at this film festival. Could I stop at this point? Yeah. That's, that's just, just, I was just, just about the... to say keep going as Mark said stop. <laughs> <laughs> you gave the idea pitch, so it's a pitch. <laughs> you will have... Okay, so, so who will dominate you? <laughs> um, no, let's stop here but, yeah. because we, we will have a chance to jump in. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Sasha. Uh, Tatiana, what do you think? <clears throat> uh, I feel that uh, actually right now it's a wonderful time for Russian... Um, serious uh, why because uh, finally we can see that they um, reached a level of certain comfort uh, with uh, this world uh, you know presence so to speak because um, I do not feel uh, any longer that it's just some provincial uh, outlet uh, which is always looking up uh, to the Hollywood standards or wherever standards you know considered to be the highest ones because uh, um, uh, we can see uh, some amazing achievements uh, that actually uh, made their way to Netflix, which justifies actually to the um, uh, level of production, both commercially really um, well uh, performed and done. And of course, the quality of material, um, if not unique, uh, then exotic enough uh, to interest uh, Western auditories. And uh, this is uh, 
um, as well, you know, coming together with the level of comfort of the domestic uh, consumer. And uh, this uh, beautiful combination brings us uh, to the question that uh, we are um, really witnessing some sort of growth and blooming uh, of uh, this uh, 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 genre. Uh, and uh, we uh, are lucky uh, to be, um, you know, really um, so overfed with some of these uh, uh, products because it's hard to imagine that if we will prefer uh, sometimes watching Russian series uh, to um, uh, the uh, famous ones because right now, for example, um, Western ones because uh, we we all um, went through. Uh, this amazing attachment to, for example, uh, Scandinavian uh, uh, Noir. Noir. and uh, we, we went uh, through um, uh, all this uh, very unhealthy relationship uh, with, um, you know, beautiful corpses and uh, dismembered uh, bodies, uh, which are never actually... And Walter White, don't forget Walter White. Yeah, yes, of course, of course. And the, and I, feel the, like I'm I feel like I'm still in that relationship. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but, uh, but the thing is that when we are looking at these newest, um, newest uh, films uh, that uh, also um, enjoy um, a couple of uh, corpses here, a couple of corpses uh, there. Um, in Russian television, we actually can't see uh, merits uh, already because it will be spiced with something so unique and so uh, actually here almost ethnographical. And at times, you know, so, so good that uh, it makes a certain pleasure uh, to uh, once again uh, look at it. Uh, therefore, you know, I um, think that uh, this is, uh, as I said at the very beginning, a new level of, of comfort, but I second Lena's uh, opinion about language that finally we're getting to this new territory with uh, some jokes we haven't heard before. Uh, because, uh, you know, every time um, uh, uh, when I uh, watch uh, shows uh, from the 70s uh, and there is a joke, um, you know, I, I already uh, ready to um, finish it. Now, uh, when, um, you know, we have uh, um, uh, people joking and they're joking a lot, we will be talking about uh, this, why actually humor becomes such an important uh, part uh, of uh, um, uh, Russian series, um, uh, serials. So, uh, you know, these jokes and you, and uh, these jokes are uh, quite complex. Uh, they hint on many uh, changes, uh, societal changes, and indeed uh, changes in culture. And um, as Lena said, uh, that testifies that it's indeed a contemporary art and it's contemporary uh, in the best uh, way possible that we are uh, actually um, ready to learn something new while living it. And so that's what I might Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, so Tanya, much. Tanya, over, over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you all very much for this chance to talk about TV in such great company. Um, and I would like to um, agree with um, Yelena, uh, I think, and um, probably develop this idea of uh, the contemporary uh, being so important a little bit further, because for me, I think the most important thing that's new about um, Russian TV series right now is the focus on the local context in the contemporary moment. And I think the combination of the two is really important because um, if we think about five years ago, when the television scene was completely determined by the national uh, channel productions, we will see that the majority of this series um, were either set in the Soviet past, um, like Otsipil and Optimisti, or adaptations like Children of the Arbat, or completely lackluster melodramas. Um, they were completely... Um, obsessed with the past uh, in terms of the stylistics and the topics. Or uh, there were some um, comedies, in fact, that were set into, in, the, in the contemporary moment. But the comedies we're talking about were largely adaptations or franchises of popular foreign productions, like with Interne, uh, Maya Prekrasna Nyanya, Univir. Zruk. Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. So the series that we, I think, are gonna be discussing today largely 
uh, like Olga and Chiki, um, they are an entirely different product, uh, which is closely informed both by the local context and the present moment. And this combination of the two, I think, is very important um, because um, it allows to um, raise uh, certain issues uh, in a completely new way. So of course, when we're talking about nostalgic productions, we, we still are dealing with uh, the present moment there too. Um, but um, some conversations become resonant when they engage with the realities that they inform them, especially when it comes to class, for example. Um, while Soviet settings, uh, they don't necessarily picture mm, the Soviet society as classless, um, they are really capable of uh, addressing class anxieties, I think, in the same way as we see done in Chicks and in Olga. Um, I think uh, specifically Chicks, they go beyond merely using stereotypes uh, and responding to anxieties, and they manage to raise issues concerning domestic violence, sexual harassment, prostitution, gender fluidity, a bureaucratic structures administrating child rearing, uh, all of it is stemming from our local context is and is incredibly timely at the same point. Um, I don't think TV was engaged in these conversations uh, even five years ago. And um, I think they are largely happening on TV now more so than uh, in contemporary film, which is largely a global trend. And Russia is actively participating in it. And the other thing I think that's important is the genre um, diversification because um, it felt like the um, television scene before was a very uh, largely dominated by the melodramatic genre, whether it's our insistence on um, a particular ending that would uh, end in a status quo, uh, <laughs> always and obviously. Uh, what we have now um, is uh, this uh, shift away from melodrama to something that's a dramedy, um, a kind of a, mm, hybrid genre, uh, cringe comedy meeting Chernucha, like we see in Czechs, uh, or sitcom meeting detective, uh, like mm -hmm. we see in Abichna um, Zhenshin, I think. And um, I think it pretty much, this diversification itself already disturbs the status quo of the television scene. Mm -hmm. the okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, so, so Tanya has already touched the, the, the area we want to, to explore first. And to, Dasha, maybe, maybe you would formulate yeah, the question. I was right? about okay. to. Uh, yeah, no, Tanya's Sorry. comments make <laughs> Tanya's comment actually makes a, a perfect jumping off point to our first um, question. And um, uh, I just want to uh, let our listeners know that um, we will not be um, telling you, like we, the moderators, what, what series the speakers are going to be covering. So they will speak about a variety of texts and uh, that way get you uh, more exposure to examples of contemporary Russian TV. So the first question um, that uh, would like to hear your opinions on is um, women's, uh, women's subjectivity and representations of gender and like Tanya just mentioned, including queer identity, uh, more broadly has come to the fore of um, recent Russian TV series. Do you think that these representations reaffirm traditional gender roles or are there ways in which they really attempt to challenge heteronormativity and uh, speak in the order, you know, if the spir spirit moves you in whichever order you prefer. Um, maybe uh, allow me to start. Um, sure, because, uh, sure, of course. Uh, uh, Tanya mentioned that, uh, um, you know, uh, it's only recently that uh, these uh, uh, topics of uh, complexity um, uh, that treat um, normativity uh, appeared. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember my uh, absolutely, absolutely unprecedented um, a feeling of uh, uh, being attached, glued to the screen and, uh, you know, lost uh, two days of my life 
when uh, for the first time uh, I watched uh, Infidelities or The Affairs or Ismene um, uh, series. So that's a, a 16 uh, episode series which was released in 2015. And um, just to remind you, of course, uh, many of you have seen it, uh, that uh, it was produced by an absolutely brilliant uh, team. Um, and, um, you know, the director himself who um, uh, took uh, this wonderful script by Daria Gracevich, who was 31 years at that moment and um, wanted to explore issues which were not, uh, in her opinion, explored uh, in the uh, uh, needed depth. Uh, depth. Um, uh, so the director uh, of this film was Vadim Pirelman, um, at that moment uh, nominated for three uh, Oscar, um, Oscar nominations for his The House of Sand and Fog uh, movie. And you know, the whole situation when you see the Russian mm -hmm. series, which is directed uh, by the uh, you know, famed Canadian American uh, film director, and you have this constellation of stars, and you have uh, the main character in this movie who um, actually is a married woman um, having an affair with three men simultaneously. So, you know, that was something, um, you know, maybe not so intriguing um, uh, for. Um, you at all, but for me it was, because you remember that in 2014, uh, there was a big shift in the state policy towards family and towards uh, these, you know, moral values that family should represent. So- all well, agenda, this, right. And gender, right. All this- and even before that. And even before that, but, but that was, yeah, uh, especially yeah. when Mizulina actually um, uh, started uh, the process and it, it went with uh, lots of lawmaking. Uh, that uh, you know, family uh, should have uh, and, foundation, and, uh, gay. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> moral values. So children is a priority. Children is a must. And and so you know, you expect that yes, uh, it actually uh, will make its way uh, to the screens. And uh, we are looking um, sometimes at these uh, characters who are just dying to make yet another um, round of cutlets, and you know, happy to see their man being home and adopting children children constantly on par with stray dogs. And so, you know, these, these kind of uh, things, they are they're done. And boom, there was uh, this um, actually is many infidelities. Um, and that was uh, also um, at the same moment when probably you remember uh, another very unusual uh, sitcom was uh, released by Damashni channel. Uh, so, uh, and that was uh, Dvainaya Splashnaya uh, about a woman who had uh, two husbands simultaneously. And uh, she was a great wife for, uh, for both of them. Uh, they, uh, her husbands lived in different cities and actually she was commuting uh, in between her family obligations. So, you know, two uh, women, um, one is the character from um, Infidelities, Asia, and uh, actually, uh, uh, this um, super alpha wife uh, from Dvaina Esplashnaya, they actually made my 2015 year uh, much more happy than I thought uh, it would be after all these changes. Um, and uh, to uh, talk uh, briefly about uh, Izmene, what's so new? So, you know, the, the question itself of uh, actually being um, uh, far from, you know, moral uh, uh, example of a Russian woman, uh, you know, and having uh, three lovers. So what, you know, two or three, it doesn't matter. It's already a transgression. It's the hugest transgression against patriarchal um, moral. And, you know, that's, that's what actually uh, brings uh, an idea of ownership and uh, women um, women being a property or being, be, being a commodity, women being, you know, immediately dependent on them. And, and, and here we saw a woman who actually uh, just uh, defied all these norms and uh, all these conventions and uh, uh, went um, away um, with um, lots of uh, encounters and freedom and um, uh, freedom uh, actually which brought uh, uh, not only pleasures uh, because uh, uh, Asia 
confesses that she just loves sex. So this uh, adoration and uh, you know proclaimed uh, value uh, of sexual life suddenly was in a way in a stark contrast with what uh, we've seen, once again, being on the country level, that we have firming in one area and this, uh, you know, absolutely um, uh, unconformist, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely free woman who was not judged uh, by um, those who produced this series, at least, you know, um, uh, Daria Gracevic uh, created uh, such an interesting uh, story behind that, you know, uh, um, some uh, men involved in the project wanted the character to be uh, actually punished somehow. So it was, you know, a story within a story uh, when uh, series entangled. And uh, therefore, what, what happens here that uh, this freedom, that was, of course, dis disobedience on a bigger level so to speak. And uh, it brought very unusual topics that uh, instead of, you know, this um, concentration on love and family values, uh, it brought a topic of uh, responsibility for the freedom, because this freedom uh, that actually uh, can be seen uh, as um, almost Don Juan-like uh, behavior, unusual for women um, uh, in Russian culture, this freedom also brought a question of violence. And suddenly this love and violence were coming together. But once again, violence here was mostly, um, you know, an allusion on this uh, absolutely, absolutely closed world where um, one, if uh, one takes a path uh, outside of normativity will be encountering violence and causing violence and, you know, bringing violence. So, you know, it was, it was an unusual, unusual project. Um, very complex, uh, very, very uh, open to interpretations. And uh, I'd say that, you know, it's only growing uh, and getting better and better. Uh, I've seen the ratings uh, and critics um, are very fond of this movie, of this series right now, more than they were, you know, a uh, long time ago. And uh, five years, five years right. had to pass, right, in right, order to, right, to make right, it appreciated. Right, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, we, we have a question to you right away from um, Yanis Siligakis. I think that, that if you answer very briefly, uh, that, that, that would be good. Um, um, Yanis writes, ha ha, if you are uh, going to go down, you may as well go all the way to the bottom of the pit. All the jokes aside, does this series portray feminine Paula Amari as emancipatory for a woman or detrimental to her emotional well-being? Was she happy with Paula Amari or she was more and more unfulfilled? Uh, excellent question. How That's would you a, answer? Yes, excellent question. You know, the thing is that um, uh, there is no immediate answer to this question. Why? Because you can read it um, both ways. From one side, um, if you uh, want to see uh, her finding new values uh, for her life and, you know, finding um, that uh, um, a woman should uh, find the right man and become, you know, this fulfilled woman, then uh, the ending of this unusual series will be uh, exactly, you know, falling to this category because um, uh, Asia, um, rides away uh, uh, together with uh, with a man who is uh, accidentally a policeman, so representative of a state's power and uh, apparently happy. But at the same time, it undermines everything that was going uh, on um, in this uh, uh, series, that if we have uh, this generation, new generation, which actually... Um, according to sociologists at least, uh, enjoy sex just for the value of sex and um, um, do not constrain themselves, uh, you know, uh, just uh, within this family because uh, that's this rebellion, not only against their husband, but probably this uh, system. So that might be, um, you know, uh, this way that uh, um, probably not detrimental, not, not, uh, not uh, harming in any ways, just a very, um, very sincere attempt to talk about 
um, changing, uh, changing uh, family um, uh, ways, uh, family uh, borders, uh, and uh, exploring something new associated with a new family uh, concept. If we're talking about you know, family as a model for the state, so here we go here, um, it will be an absolutely new um, you know, model for, for quite you know, understandable um, state. Okay, we'll return Thank to this. Channel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Who would like to go next? We are talking about gender, if you forgot. Yeah, we're still talking, we're still on the same question. Let us ask that to go next, yeah. So, and I will gladly do so. Okay, uh, uh, let me actually try to experiment with technology. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, it, 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 it's been, it looks experimental. Okay. Uh -huh. So, so you're prepared. Prepare. <laughs> Sasha comes prepared. <laughs> okay, uh, I will not present a formal paper, but I thought uh, that's very much appreciated. Maybe not everyone watched. Uh, so I would like to talk about the sitcom Olga by Ten Pet Channel. And uh, I would like actually to capitalize on uh, Tatiana's ideas uh, about changing the structure of the family and to use the term uh, my uh, uh, friend and colleague uh, uh, Vlad Strukov is using in his article about Olga family, uh, uh, a community of uh, uh, family and friends uh, uh, who um, kind of support each other and uh, upset and challenge the, the heteronormative structures uh, as we know them. So uh, this is a 10 channel uh, show about Terentia family, uh, which uh, the first season aired uh, in September 2016. By now we've had four seasons uh, and it is a uh, uh, a show about a community which I wouldn't call a family, I would call it a family exactly because it kind of challenges the borders uh, uh, and uh, I would say hierarchies, gender hierarchies as we uh, kind of imagine them. Uh, and it is definitely um, a female kind of dominated community with Yana Trajanova, uh, a major, I would say, theater, cinema, and television uh, uh, actress, and uh, I would, what is important, I think, uh, a leading female comedian, I would say, on the contemporary Russian television stage. So, so, so she's at the center of this slide that you see her uh, playing Olga, Olga Terentieva. And uh, we see a multiple kind of generations of women uh, in this family with uh, the first season uh, revolving around Anya on the left, uh, who is a pregnant teen mother who is still in school. And the entire first season revolves around her pregnancy and social and physical complications around it. What I would like also to mention about this particular uh, sitcom which was, I think, especially kind of visible and revolutionary at the time when it appeared. Uh, we have uh, female comedians at the center, and we also have something which was released on um, TNT channel. Uh, TNT channel is owned by Gazprom Media, uh, Media Holding, and um, um, Gazprom Media also purchased uh, a streaming service at this time called uh, Rutub. So uh, this particular show appeared both on TNT channel, which has a kind of a, a legacy broadcasting system, and at the same time uh, on streaming service of uh, RuTube, which uh, kind of, it, it had this dual kind of uh, uh, release uh, for an increasingly fragmenting audiences uh, who watch it mostly on, um, uh, uh, on the internet rather than on broadcast television. Uh, so, um, I would like to make one more point about uh, this uh, show and maybe to invoke some words which were already... Sasha, I'm sorry, could, could you please uh, uh, play in this uh, slideshow mode? It's too small. Slideshow mode, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. 
So Tatiana talked already about the fusion of genres uh, and... Uh, uh, Tanya, I think, not Tatiana. Tanya, Tanya, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tanya Efremova... What? Uh, Tanya Efremova played about, uh, talked about the dramedy and the fusion of, of genres. So Olga is an example of uh, dra uh, dramedy. And I would say we need to invoke one more category here that is of intersectionality while gender is again, and Tanya talked about this a little bit before me. Uh, well, well, gender I think is the central category for this particular uh, production. What is, I think, uh, also important for it, it talks about uh, ethnicity in intersection with gender. Olga has two children. She's a single mother, one from an Azeri father who now lives in Baku, and another one from a shadowy Russian uh, businessman who now lives in Thailand. So it has this kind of transnational uh, family with uh, tenuous and not so tenuous ties. Social class is very important, and uh, I can talk maybe during the discussion about this. Uh, many uh, reviewers talk about the show as set in the working class neighborhood of Chertanovo, and uh, we can talk about in which way Chertanovo is a working class neighborhood or not, but it's definitely uh, a show that deals uh, with the gender, class, ethnicity, and sexuality and uh, in a very productive way. So I talked about Gazprom Media and Rutub and TNT. And uh, I would like to conclude with saying that uh, if there is any change of hope for Russia in this show, it is in the changing constructions of femininity in Russian uh, history. And the way the show kind of presents it is through several generations of women uh, with uh, Anya being the most kind of recent kind of mature Putinism generation. Olga being the generation of the 90s, her younger sister generations of the 2000 uh, to the zero years. But there is also kind of a, an interesting matriarch figure there, uh, a grandma played by uh, an outstanding Russian actress, Rosa Hyrulina. And she plays this kind of, um, I would say, queer Baba Yaga character who is a magic helper and a <laughs> highly powerful female um, uh, presence in the film. So we have this kind of women-centered history which exists parallel to the uh, really destructive male kind of uh, uh, in, uh, uh, kind of community uh, which is on the margins of this kind of family of women. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Um, uh, Elliot uh, Borenstein, who is in the audience and we, we are happy to say hello, Elliot, um, is asking you about the citation from uh, Vlad Strukov's article. So uh, could you please uh, type it in the chat for everyone while, while others talk, right? So it's, uh, it's an article in the forthcoming issue, a collection of articles about television series where appears also an outstanding piece by Tatiana Mikhailova about his name. <laughs> So, so it's still in the same as that uh, shape. All right. Okay, got it. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, Yelena Pro. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, of course. Okay. Okay. Yelena, who, who, who is talking? Yelena or Tanya? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, apparently it's me. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, because, because, yeah, Tanya will do the most kind of up to date, I think, show. Um, so I wanted to say a few words about an interesting um, kind of, well, trend or subgenre, right, of shows dealing with uh, female agency. And um, that is shows about female androids or bots. Um, and bots, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and the robots, right. So um, the two shows that, that appeared in the last two years uh, actually um, kind of have the central character. Um, and they, they also have, they're really important in terms of their distribute production and distribution um, venues. So one is called Better Than Us, um, or in Russian, Lutre Chem Ludi. It was um, 
actually produced um, by the TNT channel for, um, I mean, uh, so, sorry, produced um, oh, by the start. But by Sreda, I think, you know. But no, mm. this one was produced yeah. by, by the start streaming service um, for channel one. But start, then, yeah, and then it was sold to Netflix where mm -hmm. it runs as the Netflix original, which basically is uh, an admission of the high quality of the series um, that can be uh, distributed globally. Um, and the other one is uh, Project Anna Nikolaevna, uh, which was produced uh, by, yes, Alexandra Tsikala Srida um, for the Kinopoisk streaming service di uh, directly. So it, it basically did not go to, um, you know, any, any um, legacy television channel, which, um, which allows um, the, these, these two series kind of, um, to, kind of to be more creative in, in many ways, um, it, but in different ways, I must say. Um, so the, the um, Better Than Us, um, you can see that it was created with a global audience in mind. Um, it is a more, kind of conventional and more conservative in terms of its social representation, but uh, obviously its sci-fi setting is much more developed. It's called a cyberpunk, right? Uh, series, um, whether we agree Which is or not, not right, is, is a complicated <laughs> thing, um, but it's um, kind of, it, it has its own audience, um, even though it was, you know, shown on, on channel one. The uh, Project Anna Nikolaevna, because it bypassed federal channels, it, for example, has a lot more, I would say, um, transgressive sexual content, uh, more racy language, more live language, including um, uh, pretty good jokes or anecdote. Some of them are quite uh, <laughs> racy for, for, for lack of a better word and funny. Um, so both shows are kind of uh, genre hybrids. Um, you know, Better Than Us is about kind of this, this central family uh, and, and the, the female robot as uh, kind of becoming, wanting to become part of a family. Um, and uh, Project Anna Nikolaevna is a sitcom essentially, but with, with the sci-fi premise of, you know, female, female robot, right? Um, so what is important in terms of gender here, right? I mean, the, the very idea of course is, is a, a woman as, as a robot, right? As a machine. Um, is both very conventional and old, right? Think Metropolis. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it can be quite a carnivalistic moment because obviously these uh, super women, right there, they are faster, they're stronger, and they are, um, well, smarter in, in many ways than, than the male community in which they're placed, right? Um, it works, uh, to an advantage in uh, Project Anna Nikolaevna, I would say, to a great advantage. Uh, it basically, you know, the, this, this bot was created or Android was created by the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the MVD, right? The experimental part of the MVD and uh, tested, sent, sent to be tested in a provincial Russian town in a police unit, of course, all male police unit. Right, so, so we have a kind of a, a tension between a female, right, who is, uh, you know, a su superhuman. Um, but of course, uh, most of the jokes are uh, not, uh, they, they are directed at male characters, which both makes fun of patriarchy in many ways, but also excludes her from the humor herself, right? And because she's, well, all, all the Ustavi, uh, were, you know, all the regulations, police regulations were uploaded into her, right? And she, she has to follow the rules. Um, she, she comes across as a stickler, right? 
uh, while male characters are flawed and weak and uh, you know uh, they they are also attracted to her because obviously uh, in both of these shows women are very female bots right are very attractive um, so um, kind of you know both upholding patriarchy and showing some of the ropes at the same time, because Anna Nikolaevna, the way she is designed, right? She can imitate human emotions, but obviously she does not feel them. <laughs> so, so when men get attracted to her, right? She, she has to act out, aka perform, right? The dating rituals or even sexual rituals and sexuality is pretty much portrayed um, quite quite openly in the show, at least for comic effect, let's put it this way, right? Um, so, and another thing I want to say, uh, what is, I think is, a, is an interesting idea in both of these shows, uh, these androids are designed by men, clearly, and, you know, kind of heteronormativity as, as the, the framework. <laughs> right, for the program um, is very important, right? One is designed by the MVD, the other one is designed by Chinese designers, specifically to be the ideal wife in this crisis of uh, women in China, right? But then shipped to Russia as the new generation of empathetic robots, right? So they, they're designed by men and they're designed to follow instructions, right? They're designed to um, imitate a perfect woman, right? And both kind of go rogue, um, which uh, and he, it, it is an interesting question, you know, uh, when these uh, bots go rogue, right? Is this funny? Is this terrifying? Is, is it um, kind of a material for cultural analysis? Because what does it mean? You know, like for example, uh, you know, if, if a, a female robot has an imitation of free will and is thus unpredictable. Is it reinforcing stereotypes? Mm -hmm. Or in some situations, you can actually see it as a material or this kind of meta commentary for cultural analysis of, of the culture itself, right? If, if this is spelled out for us. Um, so it, it raises a lot of questions. The, interesting shows, interesting shows. Um, my, my only complaint about them is that they have more potential than they realize, I think in both cases. Um, because both bots are capable of really being super, you know, super creatures, right? Super women or super, you know, um, humans, um, because they both can actually harm humans. They kind of go rogue and can break the law, the fundamental law of robotics, right? That, that robots cannot kill people. But um, either, either they, they should go uh, in the direction of actually kind of changing the, the rules of the game, right? That is the patriarchal rules of the game, right? Or take them out of the melodramatic plots altogether. But this is this is you know this is my argument already with the filmmakers. I do do enjoy them, and I find this this kind of an interesting trend. Let's put it this way. But um, and th this this comes from from my I think discussion from Asus, right? And um, Tatiana's last comment, right? Uh, that that uh, kind of they're dangerous for men. <laughs> Right, um, and indeed the concern and the, the kind of the, the spelled concern in both series is that robots are replacing humans, right? And you know, uh, they will like p police will lose their their jobs or uh, people in the future will lose their jobs and robots will take over. Well, because these central robots are women, it feels like men are afraid <laughs> of women. <laughs> Right, that that women and powerful women and strong and clever women will take over, and this this is where I stop. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Liana. Uh, may, may I just interfere with, with with just one one word, Dashomay? 
Oh, of course, uh, no, I just also wanted to interfere, so I'll interfere after you interfere. Okay, all right. So, 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 and and we we have Tanya, uh, no, 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 not no, not saying what she planned to say, uh, but. Uh, I think that that um, both what what Tatiana uh, said about Ismiany, uh, what Lena just said about this uh, Android TV series, and partially what what Sasha said about Olga, um, reminds of uh, Schnur's uh, one of the lesser known clips when uh, there is a superwoman, as you remember. Um, the, the star from, from Krizhovnikov's films, uh, Gorka, I don't remember the name, mm -hmm. who saves the world from the um, falling meteorite, etc., etc. Uh, but uh, then after, after doing all these heroic deeds, she sees her lazy husband who takes the, the, uh, the, 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 the garbage uh, and, and he says, you know, and I took uh, a garbage, you know, I'll wash the dishes. And she says, you are my hero. You're my but hero. That's after that's, that, that's far, far you, maybe perhaps but but no, that, that, that's pro probably the model the model of uh, all these films with with um, his men infidelities uh, the the sort of anarchically free woman living finally with a cop there's no other man around of course uh, or uh, the uh, super super woman in better than us uh, uh, enjoying uh, the role of the obedient wife right uh, of course with with uh, Anna Nikolaevna it's a little bit more complicated but still of course when when she's functional she is first of all taught to uh, love, Produce laughter at any silly joke of men, and that even men are scared by 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 her uh, sort of uh, desire to please. Right. So so so, so uh, we, we have here some some, some kind of uh, as as Liana mentioned actually competing uh, competing tendencies. Right. On the one hand, uh, there is a desire to 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 show a stronger and uh, independent and sort of. Um, Free willing woman, right, uh, who breaks uh, apart from the given um, gender structures. On the other hand, the, the logic of the TV series, of course, TV series is a long genre where the logic is indeed at the display, pushes her back into uh, the resemblance of this structure. Uh, what do you think? May just very shortly, briefly. Very briefly, yeah. The thing is that, you know, um, when we are talking about um, uh, these better than humans, uh, uh, women, uh, what, what they have, uh, they have resemblance to the characters that we've seen before, women soldiers who were exactly this stiff, this rigid, and not exactly fitting, um, because when they were killing, uh, that's a moment which actually made him uh, made them inhuman in some way. At least, you know, um, uh, uh, alienated them from this, um, uh, you know, uh, femininity which is uh, ascribed to them uh, by society. What I think is very inter interesting as a new aspect for us here, uh, for, an, uh, for our analysis. Why uh, these perfect machines, and um, we are talking um, about machines, why they have to be good mothers and wives. So how come that actually this robot uh, is not, actual, uh, is not um, feeling anything but uh, deficiency when she doesn't know how to, for example, to do uh, what each and every woman um, supposedly knows, how to feed a child uh, with, a, you know, with a hot cereal. So um, why it causes anxiety in a robot uh, and why, you know, robot wants to be a wife and be a married woman, that's uh, this a thing which we have to explain from a standpoint, but once again, from these um, moral values that are so sought after by the state. Well, that, that's kind of, I, I think that's, you know, the, the, that's your classic uh, contradiction of ideology because whoever presumably made this show made that in contrast to the dominant discourse to sort of like make, show these women as robots, therefore saying that heteronormativity is basically reducing a woman to a robot, yet somehow it creeps in precisely kind of recuperated back into the heteronormative discourse. So yeah. it's not mm -hmm. step for his wife. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> which, no. which would have been better and um, mm -hmm. uh, to hijack the conversation because I just did. Um, I also understand that I, I, the only thing that I can think of right now is that someone 
should write a piece on comparing what's going on in the West with the, um, I don't want to say the West because that, that was bad, in Netflix and Hollywood and compare it to Russian androids because there's been a similar trend in, um, in kind of in TV both and in, uh, in cinema, but precisely with portraying androids as uh, hyper feminized. And uh, I'm thinking about Umbrella Academy for TV and mm -hmm. Uh, Blade Runner 2049 for, for, for cinema with Anna de Armas serving this kind of perfect kind of hoop skirt 1950s housewife um, look. So I wonder if, if, if they borrow from that or if there's uh, kind of a national narrative there. But um, I, I really want to get to Tanya's take on gender because that, that's I really looking forward to, to what, what, what she's been working on lately. So Tanya, why don't you take it away? And then we can return because we have a few questions. And we, we have, uh, yeah, we have a follow-up. Yeah. No, uh, and uh, in the questions, we have questions about better than uh, than, than humans. So, so Lena, you, you, you're on tick. Well, I mean, yeah, just to, to answer Elliot's question. Yes, I, I, I do, do think you're, you're right that, that the representation in Better Than Us is, is truly, truly stereotypical, uh, especially, well, since I did not see the series that it allegedly was kind of based on, first I think it was a Swedish series, then there was an American remake, then the, there is, there is uh, you know, the Russian uh, remake of, of these remakes. Uh, I do not I do not blame them for remaking multiple times. I mean, this is kind of an interpenetrating uh, global culture, of course, right? But the fact that Russian bots have to be so good looking, there is some, something um, really kind of uh, almost like fetishistic about it. This is not even stereotypical. It's, um, it's, beauty to the point of uh, when it becomes threatening, in my view. Uh, and when they, they keep talking about, you know, like they, they, they have more in the verbal discourse, more kind of interest, potential interest, because they're, they're all afraid of her, right? Where is she at this point, <laughs> right? So constantly trying to locate this moving danger, moving target. Right, the, the threatening, uh, you know, uh, super beautiful fanbot, right? Um, in in the narrative itself, in the visual part of it, she's completely frozen. So it is it is it is both uh, kind of the pinning her down visually as as this uh, you know uh, object to to look at, and uh, you know. You, using her to propel the narrative, which I think, I think, unfortunately, loses its, its steam after the first few episodes, uh, when it becomes a family melodrama of which she is part mm. now. Um, but to answer Yanis, um, I think the Russian TV series are now less of an explicit remakes of. Um, well, Western, mostly American products than they were in the mid 2000s, as I think, well, Dasha mentioned, I think, right? Um, but there, there is this cross-pollination, let's put it this way, that um, is, um, I think Russian, Russian viewers of this series, uh, especially the younger, uh, people who watch them on platforms are very, very savvy. If you read their comments, right, in many, in many of these series, one of the pleasures they have is to basically kind of uh, finding the references, finding the quotes, uh, you know, uh, to, to other series they know, usually Western. Um, but uh, uh, some of these series are original and I hope once we move beyond Beyond the we'll, we'll, we'll move, we'll move. We just need to give the floor to Tanya. Uh, thank you, Lena. Thank you so much. Tanya, please. Uh, I kind of wanted to uh, go back uh, a little bit to. Yes, please go back. <laughs> um, Mark's polemical question about how um, somehow this um, revolutionary agenda almost um, strangely meets our, um, the structure of a TV series that um, pretty much is asking for a happy ending that uh, drives the whole 
uh, narrative to a heteronormative structure back. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, my internet keeps dropping. So I'm sorry, I just um, had to pop out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so to an extent, I think this is also what we can see in chicks. Uh, there are TV series that I focus on closely. I'll focus on closely for this. Um, specific question. So um, I think in chicks, what we see is that um, we're getting to challenge in traditional gender roles um, as uh, close as we can, but then also not quite. Mm -hmm. um, it, this hit series are, that are really produced a lot of uh, conversation in, in the summer and was produced by um, it is delightful also. If you haven't seen it before, do it. Do yeah. yourself a big... <laughs> yeah. It has an amazing cast. Um, Irina Gorbachova and uh, um, Varvara Shmykova and a few other uh, wonderful new actresses uh, in leading roles. Anton Lapienka, the internet star uh, of Russian uh, Instagram uh, in one of the supporting roles. Um, so the cast is wonderful, the acting is nice, the um, cinematography is uh, also delightful. Um, the music is interesting. Um, the premise is interesting too, because what we see uh, is we see uh, the prostitutes, uh, four prostitutes uh, pretty much quitting their um, job and are starting a business, uh, which is uh, launching a fitness center. Um, so usually with our, when we get a narrative that has a character who is a prostitute, it's uh, an immediate foil to a male character. What we see with chicks is uh, exactly the opposite. We see the uh, stories of the female characters in the center. Um, and uh, I think that's really key. So that the fact that um, the girls are, are really central and the agency is really central. Um, there has been a lot of critique um, for the finale of the show um, that kind of shows um, three of the four characters uh, happily ending <laughs> ending happily in happy ever after in uh, pretty much conventional uh, mm -hmm. heteronormative uh, relationships with men. Um, but um, indeed what I, uh, the way I see it is um, basically the claim of the genre, as a claim of the genre, as, as a demand of the genre, because, um, because chicks are using a lot of the comedy uh, elements, a lot of the comedic appeal. Um, it feels like uh, there is also an, um, a need for a happy end, a happy ending, at least to an extent. And this is how uh, the structure is being brought up with girls finding love in a very conventional way. At the same time, if we look at the guys, which, um, pretty much are the, the ones are the the ones they end up with uh, they themselves are a kind of are moving away from the traditional gender models all of them except probably Sveta's fiance who is a, a former prisoner um, they are yeah they're models of masculinity a little bit are challenging the conventional idea of what masculinity is. So in that sense, um, I would say that chicks um, at least give us, uh, gives us a variety of models that are available there. And basically allows, yeah, allows for a choice <laughs> uh, in that sense. There is one tendency though, that I think is a little bit uh, troubling. And I, I think, it is present in chicks and it's uh, also present in Olga and in um, an ordinary woman. And uh, this tendency is connected with portraying an empowered woman as uh, somebody, uh, as a woman who cannot let go. So I, I think we see it with Jana who um, always needs to be in control of everything and pretty much makes one mistake after another because of this uh, insistence on control in the situation. With, we see the same uh, structure at play with Olga, in fact, who um, is pretty much 
uh, made to uh, learn to let go in the very end of the uh, show. So she comes to an understanding of the necessity of somehow uh, stopping being in charge of all of the family. Um, we see the same uh, structured play in uh, An Ordinary Woman with Marina, um, who is, again, somehow driven to the point of uh, not being a human anymore. And uh, the ending scene uh, of the finale for her is a scene of labor. So basically uh, what we see her doing is uh, she, uh, she's encouraged to scream and she can't scream and finally she can scream. So this moment of letting go is somehow really important and the show pretty much makes uh, women are, um, yeah, overcome their, uh, their um, symptom. And I think what's troubling is that our, we see these empowered women are, who are incredibly productive and insightful. Actually, if we think about the detective in um, An Ordinary Woman too, uh, we can see yet another version of a woman who cannot let go and who is made to let go through a painful, um, um, painful experience of uh, meeting her own familial history. Um, so we see these empowered women uh, who are kind of are, are empowered because it's this symptom. And I think um, this is a little bit problematic. So uh, th there, should be, um, <laughs> there should be a way of being empowered without necessarily um, being a control freak <laughs> on the uh, Russian screen. And so far, these are the structures that I think are kind of dominating uh, the um, images of uh, uh, women who are empowered, productive, and insightful. Okay, uh, thank you. Of course, of course, it raises even more questions, but I hope we'll have uh, the time to look at them. But Tanya has already uh, touched uh, sort of the, the, the second um, question for our discussion. I'm afraid that, that it will be only two questions that we are able to cover. Mark, I, we, we, there is a sub-question to this one. Yeah, I remember, I remember. <laughs> um, so do, do you want to ask it? I do, but I okay, will th th then go to, ahead and let's, let, let's, uh, let's, I let's stop here. I will have to say to the, to the participants that I'd like the answer to be a minute, a minute and a half long max, which will make it more exciting. Uh, how does class figure into this? Because we're talking about identity, we're talking about gender, but these are all very different women. That's if we're talking about women specifically. In your, in your view, what role does class play in these representations? And I, I think that, that we should begin with Tanya because uh, Tanya and maybe maybe Sasha because uh, in, in Chiki and Tolga uh, class is uh, really more prominent than, than anywhere else. Would you agree? Right, absolutely. Um, well, with chicks, definitely, there's a, a, a class argument to be made there. Um, but I think it's actually, um, you know, our women who are being marginalized, are, they pretty much have nothing to lose and are, they have even more agency and more drive are to, to feel empowered. If I think, for instance, about the way um, female characters are represented in chicks in comparison to Sudirjanki, uh, the gold ticket. Excellent one comparison, yeah. Uh, yeah, what we see with chicks are um, women who, maybe it's hard for them to let go, but they're active and are driven by their own uh, goals. Uh, what we see with um, the gold diggers is this um, conventional, I would say, uh, approach of, um, representing a woman as a mystery, uh, as femme fatale in a way, that is totally male fantasy. So uh, in that sense, I would say that our, whenever it comes to um, talking about upper middle class, we are still very much dealing with our um, female body being uh, an object of purchase and are somehow um, responding to uh, fantasies are the patriarchal and male are structure. And here it's not like that. Uh, 
with chicks, I, I would say less so. Um, because they are absolutely not. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, once they are somehow transgress, they, yeah. their um, professional <laughs> um, necessity of satisfying. Mm. Then they are they are able to act on their own in their mm -hmm. own interests. Um, so you're saying that, that, that class and especially the fact that they are uh, prostitutes deglamorizes them, right? Do I understand you correctly? Uh, that class? Uh, what exactly deglamorizes them? The, 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 the belonging to, to, the, to the lower class and the fact that they are prostitutes paradoxically removes the glamour from their uh, sort of uh, more or less standard representation. As opposed to to Sudirjanki, to gold diggers, for example, as you said, I, I'm just rephrasing. Do um, I agree with this or not? That's not exactly what I'm saying, but I I, I think we, we no? can also, uh, we can also say that I think uh, chicks are, are much more interesting um, than uh, the women we see in, in the gold diggers, even yeah. though. Uh, the women that we see in the gold diggers are also um, active women who are, you know, are taking um, taking charge of their lives. Um, I would say they're more driven by um, the conventional stereotypical mystery uh, woman kind of fleur. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Sasha, what, what would you add if you want to? Uh, yeah, one one thing I would like to add is that uh, in Olga, for example, and well, in, in Chiki as well, women are breadwinners. Uh, they are completely independent. Uh, and uh, I think uh, if uh, they need uh, help of their male partners, it's because male partners control some strategic economic positions and not because uh, they, they are smarter, they, they just inherited these positions uh, from some kind of economic structure which existed before. The second thing I would like to say that this uh, women, uh, economically independent women driven kind of local economy is self-sufficient and it doesn't need any center, which is, uh, I think a departure from the model cinematic kind of representations of economic activities, which we inherited from the Soviet uh, cinema, where there is some kind of connection to some kind of center and it's usually male centered center. And the uh, third thing uh, which strikes me in Olga is I would say absence of the state. Uh, the, uh, the only state yeah. that is present in these films and kind of defines the, uh, the economic yeah. structure is uh, the police. Uh, mm -hmm. But police, which is a kind of, in essence, a patriarchal kind of, a kind of the outpost of patriarchal power, mm -hmm. they're like occupying power. Uh, uh, there is this kind of local economy driven by women who are the major breadwinners. And then uh, like some kind of uh, occupying force, there is this presence, for example, of the police, which- uh, Locust. <laughs> uh, uh, right, uh, uh, collects, I would say, tribute from this kind of uh, self-sufficient, uh, heartland, women-driven economy. Yeah, that's, that, that's true. Uh, I don't Liana, know, Diana, Tanya, Tatiana. Tatiana. I mean, honestly, in, in the, these shows, uh, better than us, uh, looks like uh, in the future money will be overcome pretty much. I mean, and yes, the, the bots can be very expensive, like 11 million euros, but um, uh, by and large characters do not need money. Money not mentioned very often. Um, the Anna Nikolaevna project, Anna Nikolaevna, it is, um, I think, it, it's not, the class is definitely not central. You know, once they remove it from Moscow, which is very important, right? And set it in a provincial Russian town, uh, which we are told where people all know each other, which is why it's so hard to hide 
the identity of, of, the, of the android, but it is more of a, a big extended crazy community, right? Uh, where people, you know, the alcoholics uh, and, and the sober people, but other than this, it's a very kind of traditional, kind of somewhat carnivalistic, but lovable society. So um, not much to say there. Um, you know, I think that uh, actually class uh, works uh, really well uh, in many of uh, the latest production. Uh, and it's important. It's definitely important. Why? Because it allows uh, to create uh, the new normalcy, so to speak. Even the um, names of the series, uh, uh, or for example, when we talk about, um, about Izmeni, that Asia is so ordinary, nothing absolutely outstanding at all. Like, um, you know, any other woman from the street, uh, uh, you know, after 30. So this, uh, this creates a very interesting phenomena, actually, uh, if we think that uh, if we see uh, at the amount of arrangements and transgressions allowed to these middle age, uh, middle, age middle class uh, women, uh, they are far um, uh, extend our um, imagination because they are allowed to kill, they are allowed to uh, actually uh, um, sleep around without any moral um, here, um, reprimands from, uh, you know, inner selves, and I'm not talking about it, they are, um, uh, they allow themselves uh, not to be sometimes professionals at all, and, uh, you know, uh, just uh, take money uh, without feeling guilty, uh, therefore, you know, uh, uh, exploring something um, uh, very close to the older professions, like we have with Sadirjanki, for example, uh, which is upper society, and yet uh, the roles that they are playing uh, are closer to chicks. So we we have uh, we have uh, um, strange choices associated with the middle class women, and yet we have um, the same kind of uh, set of problems with the high class women who uh, do not need to think about everyday bread and yet they think um, about you know being unhappy being unfulfilled being empty being uh, constantly struggling what's the emptiness where this void comes from uh, Amanda Karenina, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 she, no, was from, also, she was from, also an upper class from, woman. From, as social, from social <laughs> conditions uh, inside uh, the country. <laughs> uh, that, that might be uh, too, mm. uh, too. Lena has a comment. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tanya. Yeah. Tatiana, I'm sorry. Can you throw in a term which, from which we can go or not? I think, you know. Uh, I, I just realized what is the most interesting thing about Russian TV series <laughs> that we're discussing for me. It is that at the center, we have an anti-hero. It is not a traditional hero. And Russian culture has been, uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, really um, ambiguous about this. You know, we love heroes. We love socialist, realist heroes. Uh, we, we need somebody to set a moral example, and certainly uh, Izmene, I mean, the, the affairs, and certainly ordinary woman, and certainly Olga, right? All these are anti-heroes, right? Uh, they are morally ambiguous. There is no idealism to them. They have dark secrets, some more than others, right? Uh, they are badasses. Uh, and this is what makes them truly interesting because uh, an ideal female hero is a snooze which exists in a male controlled world. The, these women kick ass, excuse me for using this in, in, the, in the public forum. No, that's fine. <laughs> um, I have, excuse. Uh, one comment but like... Great female comedians and great anti-heroes. I uh, want to sort of follow up on that because, you know, we've been talking about... Uh... Dasha, Dasha, you're frozen. Uh, yeah, well, uh, when Dasha unfreezes, yes, yes. Sasha, say something, please. Ah, okay, okay. 
uh, I want to add uh, two uh, two things to what uh, Lena just uh, uh, said about uh, anti heroes. Uh, well, there is a an old book, but I think a very interesting Bakunian analysis uh, with the title "The Unruly Woman," and I think this kind of the unruly woman uh, uh, comedian is. Uh, uh, is somebody who is at the center of contemporary Russian uh, TV series. Very often it, it's in some fused genres like, uh, well, uh, what uh, Tanya talked about, or, uh, well, drama, yeah, uh, and sitcoms as well uh, earlier. And the second thing in case of Olga, Olga has a boyfriend, Grisha, who is this ideal man. And I think what is done... Super good, yes. It's the inversion of your kind of standard kind of flawed male protagonist with some kind of ideal uh, uh, female partner next to him. What what uh, the creators of this Tente show Olga did, they inverted this. Uh, we have a, a flawed and because of this highly complex female protagonist, Olga, and this kind of idealized two-dimensional uh, kind of male uh, uh, kind of, uh, well, boyfriend. Uh, well, yeah, so it's a version of a, kind of a, a traditional kind of character distribution. Uh, yes, uh, and, and, and quite, quite, quite tellingly, Grisha is in the funeral service, right? While um, uh, Olga is sort of the, the embodiment of life. Um, uh, Dasha apparently has some internet problems. I hope that she will join us. But um, so we, we, we were planning to talk about uh, other genres, to talk about uh, detective uh, series and comedies, but the time is up and we have questions. So um, I suggest that we, we will move the, the discussion to, to, to our audience um, and uh, let, let uh, you answer the questions. And if you can mention, yeah, I can say, uh, if you can mention uh, genre and go beyond, beyond uh, uh, titles that we discuss now, that would be great. But Liana has a comment, right? Yes, I have a comment. Liana. I have a comment in response to Elliot's uh, point about that. Please re re read the question, read the question, because uh, the audience cannot see them, only we can. In, in relation to the anti-hero, uh, interesting that the anti-hero trend on American TV started out as almost entirely male, but here it sounds like the opposite. If we think about The Sopranos, right, Breaking Bad, um, what else, House of Cards, Dexter, Mad Men, yeah, obviously. Um, in the, even among the recent ones, I would, I would say that uh, certainly, we have the method where we have the classic noir and a hero played by Kabinsky, right? But in these recent, most recent TV series, there is a lot of female anti heroes. And I want to point out that ordinary woman is kind of conventionally discussed in the Russian media as the Russian version of Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. That is an ordinary person, right? Uh, an ordinary middle class person who is cornered by circumstances and kind of both discovers the dark self and talent for breaking the law, right? And kind of a rebellion type of, of thing. But somebody, I forgot who pointed out that, of course, uh, in, if you closely look at Russian households, the head of the household is a woman <laughs> for many, many, many decades, if not you know, uh, a century. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that that, that Anna Mikhalkova plays, uh, you know, Walter White uh, on, in, in the Russian series as this, this anti-hero and it's so on point, so believable, right? What she has to do mm -hmm. uh, in this male world. It, it is a very good point that it could be that, that uh, you know, Russian anti-hero is a woman. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think that, that, that you answered 
uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just a second. Uh, answered Yanis uh, uh, Tirigaki's question as well. Uh, y- yes, Tatiana. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll just be very short. Uh, the thing is that, you know, one of the possible um, contexts for reading Olga, uh, I know that you will uh, shout at me right now, that will be <laughs> Razan, uh, uh, like Razan Bar. Yeah, because uh, that that will be um, uh, uh, an interesting comparison to look at these two uh, actual women as both heads of the household and matriarchs. And uh, we can see that even the outline is the same because what we have, it doesn't matter that that's an apartment uh, versus the house, uh, but it will be the same couch and the same kitchen where most of the things will be discussed the same sister in a way, um, uh, and uh, you know the same problem uh, with, uh, if not uh, husbands, then children. So uh, and the same actual economic position, uh, not so um, well done, and uh, therefore you know it might be an interesting for us case to look where the whole thing will develop. Uh, because uh, with the grandmother, as you remember, uh, she was uh, actually put in a box, in a coffin. So Baba Yaga is no more, in a way. That was a symbolical death for her. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, what will happen to Olga and what will be the outcome? Uh, that will end, because we know what happened um, with uh, uh, creator Razan. Razan. Yes, and where she is now. So... Yes, this is true. Uh, Dasha hasn't finished her thought because, uh, my internet because of is the awful. technical differences. So, so, so maybe, that, maybe you'll do it I, now. I'm glad, I'm Thank glad you. I caught the part of the conversation. And if I get dropped out, I'm sorry. That's through no fault of my own. Um, I'm glad I caught Tanya's comment right now about the similarities that exist about seemingly difficult, the seemingly different shows which which takes me back to class again. You know, we see this we see clearly an interest in diverse uh, kind of representatives of contemporary Russian society, and we see an attempt at kind of a descent to the form and to the content, creating the anti-hero, going towards like exploration of um, non-conforming sexuality, right? Like sort of like going to towards previously kind of terrian, uh, kind of terrian cognitive previously, right? But with this, with all of this diversity, uh, right, and all of these kind of different women that we are talking about. The vantage point, if we're sort of like turn back the camera and kind of look on who is making this, right? The vantage point is always the middle and upper middle class. Like the the gaze, if if so to speak, is always that. Because no matter what we're talking about, no matter what form the kind of the alternative discourse takes and whatever form of dissent we can infer, from all of this TV show, it is always liberal upper middle class perspective. And the swearing is one such instance because we should not kind of overemphasize that by the virtue of having so much swearing that is not beeped, we have like a real re- representation of the Russian lower class <laughs> because all of the swearing is just part of kind of this pursuit of realism and naturalism that goes back to like 19th century origins of liberal thought. So with all of that, not to sour everyone's excitement about how amazing Russian TV is, there the you know the 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 what what is studied might be diverse, but the perspective is always that it is always liberal upper middle class urban perspective. So all right. on this turn, I'm so glad my internet didn't drop. We can move to a different question. That's wonderful. <laughs> so 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 let's answer if you yes, Diana, go ahead. One comment in response to Yanis's very sobering comment that uh, yes. could you please read the comment, Lena? Read it, please. I would like to push back on the female hero that kicks ass in a real world. The reality could could be the opposite. These scarce dominant female TV role models, but also real life models, are ruse, a bait for the majority of women to start and try to block the male dominated structures and actually have them play one against the other and reify the importance of men in these structures at the same time give them a facade of gender inclu- inclusiveness what do you think of my not so gender optimistic view of the portrayal of these themes in the tv series are they really em- emancipatory i i'm not sure what the stress is um i i couldn't agree more uh i don't think that 
Uh, the goal of this series is to emancipate anyone. I think um, starting baby steps uh, in the portrayal of um, some types that exist in the real world, for example, a working mother um, is a beginning. I absolutely do not see them as emancipating anyone. Um, this, this is popular culture. <laughs> let's, let's admit that its goal is basically to make money. Um, and to entertain, yeah. Mm -hmm. and to, well, yes, but, uh, you know, wrapping the, the entertainment, right? As, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And by the way, uh, I must say that better than us, if there is anything that, that you retain from it is uh, the product placement plus Berbank, uh, which uh, controls and in the future will control everything from medical care to uh, basically psychiatry and economics. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just... Uh, okay, thank you. Is that okay? A footnote to, to Lena's uh, comment, I would like to mention that uh, Sberbank now uh, runs one of the major streaming services in Russia called Oka. Uh, and, uh, actually, banks are more and more kind of present and, and the internet providers like Yandex, for example, combines banking services with streaming services. So uh, it's a the common trend that to, again to respond to Yanis, I would say that the visibility of patriarchal structures does not suspend or upset them, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, so you actually started answering the question from Carol Yulan that we received in the beginning of our conversation. Uh, Dasha mentioned the importance of platforms and the different relationship that streaming programs have with the censorship than do programs on regular channels. Would each of the panelists comment on this? Which way does influence flow between the two platforms? Many thanks for this interesting discussion. So Sasha has already commented that Sberbank has it all, right? <laughs> Basically, and no, no, I don't think that everybody has to comment on that, but whoever wants to comment on that. Do, 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 do we have any comments? Yes. I would say that that uh, there is uh, definitely more taboo breaking um, on on platforms, and even if um, if a show does appear on um, on federal channels like The Method, uh, which appeared on Channel One, um, it was screened. It was broadcast at twenty three thirty. That is. <laughs> Almost mm -hmm. night, uh, because um, as Constantine Ernst quite correctly divined, right, uh, you cannot show uh, the audience, the typical audience of Channel One, which is also the audience of Channel Russia and all of them, right, which they define produces themselves as women 65 plus. Uh, anything resembling the method uh, with um, its uh, serial killer murders and extreme violence. But shows like this can appear on platforms no problem because the audience there is not only is, you know, is experienced in watching this, expects it, I would say. Yeah. Which is also uh, quickly follow up to that same question, just uh, you know, for 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 our speakers who may not be familiar with with Russian TV standards, what you know, what what was what can be labeled extreme violence or like explicit sex, it's not Netflix standard. It's still pretty tame, but by what you can see on Prime or Netflix or even on actual regular American television. It, so there is kind of a, like double down on what Lena just said. Mm -hmm. Sasha wants to, to add something, right? Uh, some histo interesting historical moment in the development of uh, streaming platforms. There was this format on Channel One called Gradsky um, Pijone, uh, City Slickers, which mm -hmm. was a late time uh, broadcast of uh, uh, TV series which uh, uh, in the US appeared on HBO or uh, uh, well Netflix. Uh, like, for example, I don't know, House of Cards appeared within this format of City Slickers. So this format existed from the beginning of 2010s, I think, maybe 2012, 
till the appearance of full-fledged Russian uh, streaming platforms. And in a mm -hmm. way, it was within the broadcast television an attempt to kind of uh, have this late night uh, screenings uh, as uh, something that targets, uh, 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 well, would imitate the uh, streaming service before streaming services, like for example, Amediateka or Mori TV or Oka, uh, developed and kind of became the, the regular f streaming services. So this Gradsky Pijone format, which broadcast major HBO and Netflix uh, uh, blockbusters uh, to uh, for this, uh, as Konstantin Ernst saw them, upper middle class people who would not watch prime time mm -hmm. you know, one product like Davai Pajenim, so but would want this quality uh, a television of Western origins, and then Ru Russians started producing their own domestic product for domestic yeah. services. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. So uh, may I ask everyone the, the, the question sort of to use the remaining time for, for maybe it, because we don't have any, any significant questions in this sort of chat. Um, so uh, you, mainly we were talking about about um, successful uh, films, right? successful series, right? Uh, we may extend this list we may add uh, for example some comedies right some some detectives but what are the genres that that uh, russian tv fail fails systematically uh, where, where where do you see sort of the the that that uh, this this new wave didn't reach or cannot reach and why and why of course great right. sure Yes, Tanya. I think maybe um, what we can are uh, say are in terms of like uh, a stark contrast uh, between the television scene in Russia and uh, um, basically Netflix and Hollywood, as Dasha has described it, is the absence of um, sci-fi and dystopia shows, um, and probably. Um, less interest to that kind of genre, although it's um, actually, I think it, it needs a sociological analysis of uh, yeah. how, how, um, how um, popular these kind of shows would be. But uh, the recent example that we had are, of a Russian TV show that was kind of trying to uh, go that way was um, Epidemia, which uh, premiered on Netflix uh, uh, under the title To the Lake. Um, so, that I would agree that that was our a less successful attempt of a Russian uh, intervention. <laughs> it seemed like the it seemed like the, um, was quite derivative in what it was doing, uh, what what it was trying to do, um, and at the same time it was kind of um, exoticizing its own context at times, and I think. Um, it might be our uh, actually seen uh, um, are uh, really um, natural within our uh, the framework in Netflix, but in terms of uh, the local audience, um, uh, some of the attempts that the show made at self exoticization were actually alienating. Uh, so there's this um, absolutely. In there's this insistence on uh, the use of uh, mm, the orthodox tradition <laughs> somehow as this um, way of saving um, saving the scene, saving the um, uh, saving the characters in the very end, and the double wedding scene looked really weird. I would say are uh, <laughs> are they saved in the end? I I've seen only the finale with with the Chinese troops arriving. No, no, that's right. But I mean, uh, throughout the series, we see, <laughs> we see so much insistence on the person in terms of, you know, the uh, the father is praying and kind of like uh, um, reaching our peace in that uh, way, and kind of the the story with the. Um, with the, the woman is getting resolved because of uh, uh, his prayer. And then the double wedding scene is, is just really weird, honestly. So like this, this strange uh, <laughs> um, um, alternative uh, insistence, I would say a reclaiming of religion and kind of separating it from the connection with the state 
well, that is what is going on. But at the same time, so yeah, because the kind of religion that we see is kind of uh, uh, at a very um, isolated monastery somewhere in the woods. So it has very little connection to a religion as being an institution. Uh, but at the same time, yes, it's, um, it's, um, I don't think it's necessarily working. Um, even uh, if we compare it to Czechs where uh, religion also plays um, significant control. Um, it just uh, seems a little bit forced, way more forced into the lake. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and the show is not really going um, far in terms of uh, creating a, um, a dystopic, a completely dystopic uh, context because, uh, I mean, it's, it's strangely balancing between our um, realism and, <laughs> and uh, fantasy world. Um, and at the same time, I mean, what the genre is usually doing, I, um, uh, I'm talking about dystopia, is um, employing the critique of consumerism and neoliberalism. And I would say that um, To the Lake is kind of uh, probably starting this way. Um, and there is a tension between the characters who represent uh, the upper middle class or like, the middle class generally, and um, some other um, secondary characters who represent the people. But at the same time, the show doesn't really go far uh, anywhere with this. Um, maybe uh, we can explain this by the fact that other genres are, are doing that uh, more effectively. Um, in terms of like critiquing consumerism, critiquing neoliberalism. I, I wonder actually what Dasha thinks about Chernuha as being. Uh, I don't think Chernuha does that. I think, uh, and I know we have very little time, so I'll just say one sentence because I will go on a yeah, roll. Okay, we'll okay, get okay, to okay, that. Okay. Uh, I think the understanding of the inner workings of neoliberalism in the Russian cultural discourse, it's still very nascent. Like the, the, it's, it's still kind of in the bud. It's, it's, it's about to emerge. But it took Russian culture, I feel, to like get a fine understanding of capitalism and consumerism itself a solid decade after the Soviet Union collapsed in the way that it exists in the West and existed in the West when Jameson wrote Postmodernism and the Cultural Logic. You all know the thing. Uh, but yeah, understanding neoliberalism and why it's bad is not an overarching topic still, right? Because also that would, you know, if, if the intelligentsia gets to there, a, a lot of representatives of creative intelligentsia will need to come to terms that it was middle, upper middle class and the intelligentsia who set up the neoliberal order in the 1990s. And that is a difficult moment of reckoning. Exactly. So I think, uh, I, 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 yeah. Dystopian narratives are not that prevalent or why the sci-fi. Oh, in terms of dystopian and sci-fi narratives, uh, I don't know. I wonder why. I actually quite like To the Lake. Yeah. Uh, uh, but Stephen, uh, Stephen like... King Stephen King liked it so yeah. much that he tweeted about this. Oh wow. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it wasn't that bad. I, I think that it wasn't that bad because it was. Uh, we saw it at the very beginning of the pandemic. So, so we just saw it, and then it happened. So, so, so it was one of those moments when mm -hmm. when the TV screen was broken uh, for us. But uh, there are other genres. For example, yeah, okay. Just a quick, quick comment, like that just occurred to me. Why is there such a dislike? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry. No. I, I was just. Um, I think it's telling that it wasn't as successful in Russia as it was as it, as successful as it was on Netflix, actually. So Black I, Russia did not produce an uproar or. Uh, even like a conversation in, in Russia, it has been censored. Don't you remember? There was a it huge was, yeah, scandal. It was, it was interrupted. It was interrupted when there appear troops that are killing um, uh, sick people. The, 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 it was interrupted, civilians, right? Uh, interrupted for a few days. And then in the next episode, they inserted the radio broadcast saying that some kind of rogue people in the army uniform are killing sick people. So, so it I cannot remember anything like that since since when. I don't even remember since when. But uh, um, another question, for example, there, uh, sorry? They brought it back though, right? 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so, so the, 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 there are other genres, right? Which we which just either failing or underrepresented. Um, uh, Tatiana is nodding, and then I will give the floor to Sasha and maybe Lena if if Lena wants to add. Uh, once again, really, um, you know, uh, short commentary. So what I am really dissatisfied with, uh, that's uh, biopic, so to speak, in this series. Uh, because uh, whenever we have a wonderful, wonderful possibility to talk in depth, uh, especially about some, you know, outstanding woman, uh, what we have as a result, we have a very average and the dull, uh, in fact, a story uh, that is uh, crafted according to the rules on how um, the product should be um, perceived by public from one side, uh, what to sell and here we go with the glamour uh, or with consumerism right away when we're talking about, for example, uh, Krasnaya Karalieva, right? The Red Queen, yeah. The Red Queen or Berioska, where we have women um, transgressive in their nature absolutely uh, falling um, outside of this logic um, uh, of the Soviet, um, um, you know, model for a uh, woman uh, acting. Uh, and uh, what we have, um, we have constantly and satisfied with her you know, feminine, either virtues or values or family, you know, a person who is struggling to fit in. And we know that these women were not fitting in and they did not want to fit in. And so um, why they therefore take such material and do um, you know, uh, such a, a dull product with it, uh, that always uh, interests me um, because uh, we see uh, more and more and more this kind of uh, product being introduced to us. Thank you, thank you. Sasha, please. Uh -huh of short uh, uh, notes about biopic. I completely agree with Tatiana, and I think one of the reasons why a biopic is a problematic genre, both because of genre memory, because biopics wa was a higher style in this genre, and also because very often a biopic in contemporary Russia becomes a corporate biopic. And uh, to involve the most recent example is uh, the mini series by, uh, I think, Channel Russia Bomba uh, about the creation of the atomic bomb. And uh, uh, it's a kind of, it's, uh, it's funded by Rosatom, which is a Russian atomic energy agency. And it celebrates, I, I forgot, the, the 70th. 75th anniversary, so it's a kind of a biopic about a corporation at the center of which among the, mo the, the, the major corporate captains and very efficient managers is Comrade Beria and some other lesser uh, uh, characters. Less efficient. Uh, less efficient characters, right. Many of them are prisoners in the camp. Um, uh, second, uh, I would like to go back to the notion of kind of uh, trying to fathom uh, the dead ends of neoliberal economic order. Uh, I think Olga is one of the shows which uh, tries to kind of uh, navigate the territory through uh, the genre of dramedy and to kind of map the territory of this kind of neoliberal economic space and the dead ends uh, for the characters in this. Uh, in new economic order. And finally, a really short notice uh, note about Chertanova as a setting for many blockbusters and the TV, mini, uh, TV series in Russia. Uh, Chertanova, especially the, uh, the neighborhood where Olga is filmed, or uh, uh, what was recently? Epidemia. Epidemia is filmed. Uh, <laughs> is actually was conceived as uh, one of these exemplary neighborhoods for the late uh, Soviet era. They even mm -hmm. planned, if you remember in the Soviet times in uh, Moscow, there were sto uh, stores named after capitals of the socialist countries like uh, Leipzig. So Leipzig is still standing yet. You <laughs> drunk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let me just finish uh, what they were planning to build there. There was a plan to build there a, 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 a grocery store and a store for consumer goods 
uh, in the uh, for um, uh, for the U.S. It was part of the agreement uh, with uh, uh, well uh, during Nixon's visit in the early 70s. There was a plan to build such a store in uh, in the Soviet Union in Chertanova. And uh, probably if they built it, the Soviet Union would have ended a couple of uh, years earlier, I'm afraid. Uh, so it never happened. Walmart was built in the Soviet Union. And, uh, uh, but I think Chertanova as this place of kind of uh, late Soviet utopia and at the same time dystopian kind of setting to which uh, post-Soviet filmmakers go back and again and again as some kind of trauma slash uh, kind of uh, uncanny, uh, I don't know, twilight zone site. The point of trauma, yeah. Uh, so we, we, we have uh, literally one minute left. Therefore, I suggest very simple. Just name uh, one or two series, just name, no comments, uh, which we didn't mention, but which is worth uh, binge watching. Please, who, anything. The Last Minister, I think, is worth watching. The Last Minister, the Last Minister. Very good. Tatiana. Akayanne Dni, Sidi Adoma. Akayanne Dni, Sidi the COVID comedies. All right, thank you. Lena, Sasha. I would name uh, Damashni Arrest, although maybe everybody has seen it already, but still worth, worth watching. Damashni Arrest, the home arrest. Well, uh, звоните Ди Каприо, call Ди Каприо. Звоните Ди Каприо, Жора Крыжовников's uh, TV series. All right. Sasha. Uh, well, uh, I don't think it's... Uh, I think it's an important inter uh, series in terms of high production. <laughs> That's the type. <laughs> uh, well, it's actually a remake of a Soviet-era uh, TV series, Ugrium Rika. All right. Ugrium Rika. All right. Dasha, do you have anything? No. No. All right. On, on this <laughs> optimistic we note. All of our bases, the entire sure. TV production in Russia has been covered tonight. <laughs> Nothing is left. Nothing All right. Left. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so dear much. panelists. You. Uh, we had a great time. And thank you, those who stayed with us. And uh, thank you, Elliot Borenstein, for being with us. Uh, and thank you, Yanis Sigilakis and uh, Carol Yuland for, for your questions. And uh, I hope we didn't disappoint you. And I hope that the series won't disappoint you either or disappoint you less after our warnings. Sasha, what? Thank you. Did you Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to point out to Elliot Borstein of the Netflix series, I'm not sick of Kiro Caro. I absolutely cannot stand him, and I don't know why. Uh, but I understand that he is also a type of anti-hero that is non-heroic uh, hero. And he's everywhere, and this is probably what upsets me. <laughs> Elliot, he, and I am sick. I am sick. I am with you in this one. So I they, can't see him any longer. Um, so, 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 so we, 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 we are ending uh, this, this, this broadcast with the hate talk. No, being, being, sick, being sick of Kirill Kiro. Uh, so but we love Anna Mikhalkova. All right. <laughs> Let's stop here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That is it. Thank you so much.